mean it, that we know you, that we seek you. God, you are amazing. So we ask this morning that you would prick our hearts and prepare us to hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy New Year, church. I missed all of you. Some of you may or may not have noticed, but I and my family were not here at the end of last year. Um, and that is unusual for us. We usually leave Christmas morning uh, or Christmas kind of afternoon. So we're usually here through Christmas Eve and then we go to visit my mother-in-law and other family members who are down in Texas. Um, but this year we decided or I should say I decided, that we were not going to fly, we would drive. <laughs> and so as I get into the message today, and God spoke very plainly and very specifically to the prophet, he told him to consider his ways. <laughs> or I should say he told the people to consider their ways, but for me it was consider your ways. Really think about what the think about the decisions that you're making so as we get ready for the new year as we prepare for our 21 days of prayer and fasting how many folks are excited about that yeah. all right so if this is your first year with us at living hope church we do prayer and fasting uh, at the beginning of every year for 21 days starting from the first sunday and then add 21 and then we'll end uh, on on another sunday so be prepared for that as you go out today into the, um, into the community center or um, if you come over to the Pasadena campus later on, you'll be able to get some materials to talk about our, our prayer and our fasting, how we do that, different types of fasts and what it really means. But the real focus that I want you to do is, to, what I want you to do is really focus in on God. That's what a fast is supposed to do. If you only fast by not eating and you, or you, 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 you separate yourself from things, let's just take food, for example. Let's say you don't eat, right? I know, you don't eat, right? But if you do that, but you don't add in the focus in on God, it's just the diet. So as you are deciding and as you are removing things from your life, remember that the removing of things is in honor to God. So that as you do it, it does teach you something. So when you get hungry, God, I thank you that you are good, God, and you have provided food. But I'm not having this because I really want to know you more. If you're fasting from technology, which I would recommend for everyone, including me, as you have that craving to update Facebook, Lord, I thank you that you've given me a word. You have given me your status. You tweeted to me. You posted a blog. You did all of those things. You even gave me Instagram. If I go outside, I can see everything filtered in perfection. Thank you for that. So that's how you look at your fast. That's how you go through it. Don't just remove things and live 21 days and then just go back to normal. Focus in on God. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's all I'm going to say about the fast. So as we get into today's message, if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in the book of Haggai. And we're going to be there all day. We're not going anywhere else. We're not go I may mention some things, but there is nothing else for you to go to in your Bible. For those of you who don't have it with you, it will be on the screen. We're just going to walk through this and share, as I share a little bit about what was going on in, in Israel at the time of Haggai. So our flagship scripture for this morning, and you don't have to show it yet, is going to be verse 5, and I've already mentioned it, Consider Your Ways. Verse 5 says, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. So verse 1 reads, In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet to Zerub Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Haggai prophesied 
during the reign of King Darius. In the year, so it specifically gives you a year, the second year of King Darius. That is around 502 B.C., for those of you who like that kind of that information. Haggai was one of the prophets that returned to Jerusalem with the remnant after the Babylonian captivity. He also was the prophet along with Zechariah. So there were two prophets that were prophesying over this remnant of Israel. And, but they were very different. So if you read Zechariah, Zechariah was what we would call uh, an, an in-the-air prophet. He was very, he was high level. He was talking about the, the, the high things, the, the, the things that are way up here, the things that are above you that you need to focus in on. Like we talk about focusing in on God during your prayer and fasting, okay? But Haggai, on the other hand, was what I would call it on-the-ground prophet. Haggai was... Thus saith the Lord, right here in your life, in this situation that you find yourself in, this is what you should do. That's Haggai. So this morning, as we walk through this, that's what I'm going to do, is kind of be that on-the-ground prophet as I read to you the Word of God, because that's what Haggai did. He spoke to the people in a practical way about the situations in their life. So on to verse 2. It says, thus says the Lord of hosts, and he's going to say Lord of hosts many times. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruin? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. So the remnant returned from captivity to Jerusalem, the city of the temple of God. And they were there. And they were a part of it. And they were seeing everything that was going on around them. So they saw the temple. It had been destroyed. It wasn't there. It wasn't there for them to see. Some of them were even old enough to remember the temple in its former glory. And we'll get to those folks in a little bit. But as they returned there, they didn't immediately return to God's house. They began to build their own homes, began to prepare them in a practical sense. Okay, where am I going to live? What is it going to look like? Let me put this together. And God really told them to think about it. Where are you now? The temple had laid in ruin. It wasn't there for them. They didn't have things. But God was reminding them, and he was telling them to consider their ways as we move into the next verse, because life wasn't what they thought it would be. So they were out of captivity. They had returned home. They were no longer under the oppression. But yet, life wasn't what they expected. Verse 6 says, you have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does so to put them into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Here's an idea. What has God told you to do? 2013, brand new year. If you are so inclined, you have resolutions. I'm not inclined to do resolutions. But for those of you who are, what has God given you to do? What is the work that he has called you to do? Because God is very plain about the things of him. He has made himself available to you. I joked about God's status updates and his tweets and the Instagram of outside, but it's true. Just like you can see a picture and pull in what's going on in that photo, God has made himself clear in his word. He has given you the things to do. But a lot of times we are, you know, and I've said it myself, you're confused or, you know, God, I don't know your will. I don't know what am I supposed to do, Lord. But a lot of times, at least for me, and I'm only talking about Carlton. I'm not going to talk about anybody else. As far as Carlton is concerned, sometimes I just want You know, I want God to take, so I don't have to make a decision. Lord, just tell me what to do. I don't want to have to think about this anymore. What do I have to do? But sometimes God 
is telling you, I have given you the tools, I have given you the wisdom to make a decision. You need to do something. I posted something earlier in the week for all you Facebook folks that says, God expects the farmer to pray with hoe in hand. (laughs) If you're going to plant a garden, you don't look at the land and say, Lord, bring forth. You've got to get out there with your seed and the hoe in your hand and you've got to dig it up and you've got to get dirty and you've got to get into it. And that's what Haggai was bringing to the people. But in this case, luckily enough for the children of Israel, God had a word for them. And God said, and this is why I said practical, go up into the hills and bring wood and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and that I may be glorified, says the Lord. Very clear. Right there in front of you. God said, go do this. And this is why. So I ask you to think about it. What have your current actions gotten you versus what has God told you will happen? Because when I go to do things on my own, again, this is only Carlton. When I do things on my own, when I make my own stuff and I ignore what God has told me to do, I have certain results. But they're always vastly different from what God does. And God is about to remind the children of Israel what a life out of balance looks like. Verse 9, you looked for much, and behold, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruin, while each of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth, on man and beast, and on all their labors. What have the results been? I know this isn't your normal Happy New Year message. It wasn't for me as I read through Haggai, and God was with hoe in hand, or I should say with chisel and hammer, saying, Carlton, what were the results? What did you see from your actions? What did you do? What did I tell you to do? And then he said, will you go? Verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him and the people, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke to the people with the Lord's message. I am with you declares the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. On the 24th day of the month, in the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. So the question I have for you is, what will your answer be? God has called you to something. If you look in his word, he called you to make disciples. If you look in his word, he called you to work in his house. In in, in his word, he called you to be a servant. He's given you the answer. It's not about a dot on a piece of paper that you can plot point to point to point. He has given you what you need to do. The question is, will you answer his call? Consider your ways, the Lord says. So as we move into chapter 2 of Haggai, I leave you with that. On your notes, they look very different. I'm I'm more of an essay guy. 
So if you see a lot of lines there and some questions, that's because I give homework. So you can take that with you and you can answer those questions and you can think about those. For my small group friends, we'll be talking about this one on Thursday. So be prepared for that. Chapter 2. In the seventh month of the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. I'm going to stop there for a second. Notice, we're now a month later. So the people answered the Lord. They were fired up for God. The the governor of the town, the political leader, was like, let's get it done. The high priest was there. Yes, let's get in there. Let's do this thing. And now we're a month later. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? So a month of work has happened. If you look at this time frame, we're now at the end of the Feast of Tabernacles. Tabernacle is the temple. So that means that for the six days prior, because the Feast of Tabernacles is seven days, For those six days, the people saw what they had accomplished in a month. Now, how much of the former glory of Solomon with the the cedar posts and the gold floors and the silver this and the silver that, how much of that do you think was there in 30 days or a little bit less than 30 days? Probably not a lot. So as the people were trying to be joyful for the Feast of Tabernacles, there were some whose cry of that their shout was more a shout of lament and not a shout of joy. And God met them where they were. How many of you remember this place in its former glory? This is more of a comment to some of the the legacy LHC members. How many of you remember this house in its former glory? In where we are now... Where are you? Is your cry a shout of joy or is it a lament at what used to be? But God was clear. It's nothing in your eyes. And he doesn't argue that point. He doesn't say, look at what they've done. He says, it's nothing in your eyes. But don't worry about what you see. Verse four, yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts. Yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of our nation shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace declares the Lord of hosts. God is telling them, I am doing something. Don't worry about what you see. Don't worry about what you see. So now we move ahead. Now where a few months have passed. The task is complete. Verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the king, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches his fold bread or stew or wine or oil of any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. If I had, I'm going to stop here for a second. If I have something that is holy and I touch something that is unclean, does it make the unclean thing holy? No, it doesn't. 
Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with the dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. So they had finished the work, but life had it returned to the glory they were expecting. And they were beginning to have some issues. So God met them where they are. And he said, if I take an unclean thing and I touch a thing that is holy, does it become holy or unclean? God began to ask the people to think about why are you doing this? Are you building the temple because you expect to be blessed? Or are you doing the, doing the work, are you building this temple so that I would be glorified? And if you came into this unclean, which they had, is the fact that you did this work suddenly making you holy? No, it isn't. I am the one who can make you holy. So if you don't seek after me, if you're not chasing my glory and you're not finding yourself in that, you cannot be made clean. Verse 15. Now then, consider from this day onward. Before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail. Yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider this, consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider. Is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. So he's reminding them, remember, you came into this and you were being chastised. You were being chastised. But I tell you, from this day forward, because you sought me, I will bless you. But the question I have for you in that is, is God enough? The last time I got to speak before, the, before all of you, I asked you a question. If your situation never changes, is God enough? Is having him in your life enough for you, even if the circumstances that you find yourself in don't change? Then the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. It's the same day. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth. I have a plan. God has a plan. And to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I am about to destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders. And the horses and their riders shall go down, every one by the sword of his brother. So not only will you win, but you won't have to raise your sword because they're going to destroy each other. That's a victory like none other. Verse 23. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord. God has a plan, and it is glorious. Let me tell you about Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, his name means seed of Babylon or son of Babylon. More than likely, he was born during the captivity. But that's not the interesting thing about Zerubbabel. Shealtiel is in the line of Christ. Zerubbabel, who God said, I'm going to make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, is in the line 
of genealogy that leads to Christ. God has a plan that you may never see, but that doesn't change the fact that it's glorious. It doesn't change the fact that this momentary struggle that you go through isn't leading to God's glory being known. I listened to a pastor uh, just a few days ago, and he made a comment. He said, you know, when we get to heaven, when we get to heaven, and we see the great multitudes of believers all around us, and he was talking specifically about his church, he said, I'm going to go find all my staff members. And he said, and I'm going to ask them, did you see that lady over there who is honored by God, and she was a part of our congregation. Did you know her? Because I didn't. But she's honored by God. Because even in her light and momentary struggles, she reached out and spoke to one who went and reached millions. Not all of you are called to preach. Amen. But all of you are called to reach someone. All of you are called to be discipled and to make disciples. So the question is, are you praying with your arms behind your back like this, tapping your feet, waiting to see it happen? Or do you have your tool in hand ready to get to work? 2013, or 2012 is gone. You can't do anything about it. No matter what kind of congressional magic they did to make that extra day happen so that we didn't roll over to 2013 so they could make a decision, we don't have that luxury, nor did that magic actually happen. 2013 came the same time that 2014 will come next year. The question is, what's in your hand and what are you doing? God says to consider your ways, know him, and make it happen. Let's pray. God, we are excited because it's a new year. And even though we find ourselves being raked sometimes, even though your chisel is hard and it hurts, but God, we are grateful because you are the one doing the chisel. You are the one whose fire I go through and become like gold. You are the one who refines us, all of us, as your children. So we ask you this morning, God, what is it that we should do? And we praise you because you gave us your word and you told us what that is. Now, God, because you can do more than that, give us the power to actually get it done. So that our relying is on you, but we rely on you putting one foot in front of the other. As we go from this place, we are grateful that your presence travels with us. That it is everywhere and that we can be reminded of your glory in the sunshine and rain. And the rain. And we thank you, God, that there will be rain. Because without rain, the crops won't grow. God, we are excited that you are doing something. And it is glorious. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Happy New Year. As you get up, this morning. Make sure that you greet someone. Don't just fly out of the building. <laughs> say hi, say happy new year, high five, hug, whatever it takes. Meet somebody. I mean it. I'm being, you know, thus saith the Lord, meet someone. <laughs> All right? Amen. Amen. I do. I have them. No, no, I'm not. You cannot meet me. You cannot meet me. Just for you.